Ahoy there, you body buccaneers. Time to put your piratical know-how to good use as we live the pirate's life in Shiver Me Timbers. Steal yourself for battles with fellow sailors, fully armed fortresses, and towering sea beasties. So load your cannons and let's set sail. Give each player a playmat, a treasure track, a chest, and a set of color-coded tokens, and a ship for starters. Your ship actually comes in a lot of pieces, so really it's a pile of ship. Ah, pile of ship. <laughs> Shuffle the life goal cards and deal enough for one per player, plus one extra. Place them face up on the board on the appropriately meeple marked spaces. The rest return to the box. We'll get to those another day, matey. Each player secretly decides on two of them that they intend to work toward, chooses their corresponding token, and drops it in their chest. This way, later on, after you've smashed that goal, you can prove that this was your intention all along. But keep it to yourself, so no other players will try to beat you there. In this case, let's work toward that Eldorado goal. It'll be hoarding gold. It'll be hoarding gold. This part works much better if you keep your mouth shut. Bloody parrots. Next, look through your tokens and pick a port of origin and a talent. Again, don't reveal these just yet. Let's go with these. I know, I know, I know! Oh, that's all you get. Place the tokens face down on your playmat for now. They'll be revealed soon. Now to set up the map. We'll be using a second table for this, since it can take up a lot of space. Any objections? <laughs> Separate the islands from the monsters, and the long sea routes from the short sea routes. Randomly pick two islands and one long sea route and connect them up. Now it's high time you nominated a first player. Do that how you will, and that player chooses one island and one sea route to add to an existing island. Player two, same thing. Oh, and you can rotate a route one click if you like before connecting the new stuff. Keep going until the sixth island is out there, then each player adds one last route each. There's your kingdom, mateys. Rule it. Add the wee stat standees next to the proper islands. These have handy trading info. You can also lay them down if you like. Shuffle the fortress markers and deal them out to the island spaces. And while you're at it, separate all the markers there's player markers, which come in four different colors. Also, white and red trader markers. Sea monster markers. Plague markers. Ew. Family markers. Aw. Wind markers, and a lot of them. We had to shuffle them into two stacks. And go ahead and flip the top one face up when you're done. And finally, cha-ching, gold. Well, copper, silver, and gold worth 100 500 and 1,000, respectively. Ah, uh, gold, 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 gold. Hi, <laughs> even Polly wants that cracker. Now take the white-sailed merchants and seed the roots on the white circles. You need something to fight. Also drop the various dice, the gems, as well as the reference sheets. Hey, there be a lot of info on the table. Now for the cards. Separate and shuffle the treasure cards, mission cards, crew, ritual, and the dual cards. They be the short ones. Now the dual mini. Ready for action. Okay, let's get personal. Flip those origin and talent markers, now that no one can change their minds, and get your ships fit for sailing. It goes like this. You start with three speed, which means three total skull icons, and three strength, which is a total of three cannons, including that permanent one on the front. Don't forget. And size three. This means you have three dials, which are cargo holes. They start on black, which means empty. The ships start on their port of origin, and you take any equipment shown on your origins marker. The final bit is to accept 300 gold, which is three copper doubloons. You can handle that, yes? Now on a turn, you can do three actions, and here's your list of options. Travel, upgrade, trade, hire crew or learn rituals, treasure hunt, take a mission, attack ships or fortresses, and finally... Fight monsters! Let's break these down one by one. Travel. You'll use this one the most. Your maximum speed is the current number of skulls, plus the current wind value. It could be plus or minus. Also, if there's a blue die icon, you need to roll that before every travel action. 
upgrades. So all ships start with a value of three in size, speed, and strength. Each upgrade action can bring one of these up one point and can only be performed on islands. Let's say you wish to upgrade to speed four. Well, it'll cost you 400 gold because four times 100. Then you need to up the number of skulls displayed on your ship. Take down your two masts and replace with the main one, which has four. Now you're next level, mate. If you upgrade strength, add a cannon. If you upgrade size, slide the hull loose and add a segment with the dial. Set it to black for now. Next, let's trade. This refers to both buying and selling. When you make port on an island, check the standee. The red hand icon is what you can buy and how much it costs. The blue hand is how much they'll pay you if you sell a particular item. When you perform a buy or sell action, you can buy or sell as much as you like, respectively, when you perform that action. If you buy an item, rotate the dial from black to the proper color. Cocoa is brown. Sugar is white. Rum is yellow. Not a perfectly matching color, but better than purple. You can also sell treasures once you have some. Just collect the cash and discard the card. Hire a crew or learn rituals. The bay is your place for crew, and Ila Oscura is for rituals. So when in one of these places, draw the appropriate card and add it to your hand. There's a hand limit of three per type, so if you need to, discard a card of that type before drawing a new one. These cards can be played any time any player announces or ends an action, and many of them have a cost to pay, but it's absolutely worth it. Treasure Hunt. So when you're on an island, you can perform this action to draw the top three treasure cards, Pick the one you'd like to hunt for, and toss the other two back under the deck. Again, limit of three treasure cards, in hand or on the treasure track. Now, after you have a treasure card and find yourself on the proper island, perform this action again to begin a treasure hunt, which looks like this. Drop the card on your board and put a gem on the first step. Take a white marker and drop it on the number indicated. That's how far you must journey, mate. Now, if all this has already happened, Perform this action again to dig. Move that marker forward the number of steps matching your current strength, so you may wish to upgrade your cannons first. If you finish your movement on a space with a die icon, roll the die of the matching color for a resource bonus, or nothing at all. It's all up to fortune, matey. There's also a speed bonus to be had. The final number is an amount of resources you can abandon to move that many spaces forward. Optional but handy. Once you do catch that white marker, the hunt is over. Move that treasure to your ship and gather a bonus, if there be a shovel icon. But if there's a compass instead, you have a shiny new ongoing effect. You also have the option of moving the card to your protected chest as a free action, if you don't care for the ability. Or you could sell it, but that's up to you. Missions. When in Port Royal, perform this action to draw the top three mission cards. Keep your favorite and send the others to the bottom of the deck. Official missions go straight to your player map for all to see. You're far too transparent, mate. But if it's unofficial, it hides in your hand. You'll know these by the closed eye icon. Honor system, scallywags. When you complete a mission, reveal it, prove it, then tuck it away in your sea chest to save the glory points for later. Attack ships and raid fortresses. Let's get to the action. There are three types of battles to engage in. A gunfight is an attack on an enemy to bring their numbers down to size. You can only attack if you're on the same space and have greater speed than your target. If you attack a merchant, just instantly place a damage marker on that boat. Pow! If it's a rival player's rig, roll the red damage die. And if it's strength, size, or speed, then remove one upgrade of that type. However, each stat can never reduce below one. Raids are how you take down those mighty fortresses. And again, you must occupy the same space. Flip the token and see what you're in for. It might say that other players can lend a hand. If so, they must decide now. And finally, fight that fortress in a duel. What's a duel? Well, that's the third type of combat. A duel is also called a boarding attack. When targeting another ship, you must be in the same sea space as the target. And that can't be an island space. If you target a merchant, flip that token and size them up. Starting with the attacker and moving clockwise, all players get a chance to play crew or ritual cards for this combat. Place the pirate mini in the center of the duel zone, also called the plank. 
The Lady Pirate represents the attacker, whereas the Dude is the defender. First off, compare strength values of both sides and determine the difference. Push the weaker captain that many spaces. If you're strong enough, you could end the combat right here. Oh, and those damage tokens on merchants reduce their strength by one per token. If both captains be still in the game, deal each four duel cards and prepare to cross blades. In case of a merchant or a fortress, the player to the attacker's left will play the part. <laughs> <laughs> you just don't give up, do you? The player with the greater speed value decides who goes first, and you're off and running. If you choose to play a red attack, the other player has a chance to use the blue side of one of their cards to fend off the attack, if it matches the attack. You may also pass, but where's the fun in that? After the attack resolves, the other player does the same, and carry on in this way until the cards run out, or someone gets pushed off the plank. And well, here's the aftermath. If you're fighting a merchant or a fortress, do the following. In case of victory, take the token and drop it into your chest, taking the printed reward also. In case of a fortress, it's too grand. If you suffered a defeat, lose an upgrade of your choice and end your turn. If it's a tie, just end your turn. If you are fighting an opposing player, it works like this. Whoever won gets a marker matching the loser's player color. But you can't have more than one per color, so now you're maxed out. Then you get to look over the loser's ship and choose one reward. Half of the loser's gold, rounded down. Half of the loser's cargo, rounded down. Or one treasure card from the loser's ship. Eh, they weren't really using it anyway. The last action is fighting monsters. Taking these beasties down works more like a treasure hunt than a ship battle. Place a marker of an appropriate color on the first space of the monster track. Then you'll move it according to the stats listed. This will be either size or speed this time. If you end your movement on a die when battling this baddie, roll the die and take the damage to that area. It's bad business, mate. If you make it to the end, remove the creep and grab yourself a monster marker to keep as a reward. There are also a few free actions to keep in mind, such as discarding a card from your hand to make room most likely, and moving a treasure card to your safekeeping chest, things like that. Now, when the round ends, do a bit of prep before passing the baton. Draw a new wind token. Replace any empty slots on the sea routes with the top token on the merchant stack. Flip a yellow jack marker to an active. Then, and only then, may you begin the next round. Round and round you'll go until the end game condition is met. And here it is. When the second to the last life goal is completed, it's time to finish the round and go to scoring. That's game. Each player adds up their victory points on ships, fortresses, cards, and other markers. Gold is worth one VP per 1,000, and you're likely to have change. It's now worth nothing. If you experience a tie, break it according to who has the least amount of mission cards. Doing business with the crown is frowned upon in buccaneer circles. Now them's the gears that make it move. Time to weigh in on the experience. Let's get the obvious out of the way. It's gonna be impossible not to compare this to merchants and marauders, so we're not gonna try. Both are fairly open-world games, with lots of different ways to spend your time. But Shiver Me Timbers brings a few new ideas to the sandbox, and we liked it. In a lot of ways, your approach will stay the same, as you find the strategies that are most comfortable for you. But unfortunately, unlike Merchants and Marauders, this can harm you in the long run, since the endgame condition changes every game, which is our biggest problem. But let's get to that in a second. The good stuff is that nearly every mechanic this game employs works. The dueling minigame is clever once you get the hang of it. The side activities are great. I tried a different one every time. Missions, trading, etc. This is a large collection of good ideas, and I'm inclined to believe that they could even take it further if it proves lucrative for them. I'm excited to own a proper copy for this, but to be fair, let's look at the few complaints we have. Our second biggest complaint has to do with the components. But since this is a prototype, it could change completely. The ships are too big for the board at times, and they grow throughout the course of the game. So fitting two or more ships on the same sea route space is cramped. Like these pieces are from different games cramped. And changing the stats can be stressful. Am I gonna break it this time? I've not gone for an upgrade at least once, because I didn't want to deal with transforming the ship. 
It's a cool idea, but it was far less fun when I was finally playing the game itself. And moving cargo is a delicate business. Moving one dial bumps another, and it can just get... Yeah. It could be replaced with a few stat areas on the playmats, but we'll see what the final product looks like. Because honestly, the modular ship is the hook. Now our biggest issue isn't even really an issue because it can be house ruled easily. End game. Why it's tied to life goals? I'm not sure. You sail around the world accomplishing a great many things, but you soon realize that the game could easily go on forever unless somebody works towards the life goals. Unfortunately, you've got one person bent on slaying monsters, and so-and-so over here getting rich trading. But none of this activity works towards the end of the game, unless the cards say so. On our second game, it occurred to us that a simple round timer could be just the thing to shut things down early. I mean, being the one to end the game doesn't make you the winner anyway, so why not just run a timer and tally score according to what players want to accomplish? If you have a favorable win for fighting merchants, but the life goals don't include it, you don't want to stop. And if the other players are of a like mind, then mate, you need another way to call time. We're all just here to make a living after all. Uh, you gotta let me out. You gotta let me... Uh, 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 uh. Well, that's all we've got. Shiver Me Timbers is headed back to Kickstarter soon, and we recommend it highly. There's a great wee water world here. And this is one that could be expanded to the edges of the world. But get yourself a big table. This one has a Sasquatchian footprint. Thanks for watching this Pirates Parlay. And be sure to connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And check out our recently revamped shop at PiratesParleyGaming.com. Get yourself some scurvy swag or for your favorite pirates. And we'll see you next time here on Pirates Parlay. <laughs> <laughs>